Welcome, welcome to the um the debut version of uh, the Little Platoons live stream. It's something we're quite keen to do more of in the future as the channel grows. And as it's coming up to Christmas and it's coming up to the new year and there isn't a huge amount in the news, it's an opportunity to explore a few more like casual formats, um, sit down and and talk about some nice things. And in the case of uh, in the case of the Matrix Resurrections, some pretty pretty damn terrible things as well. Um, but uh, yeah, we've got a, we've got a bit more content coming out. Um, we're not going to be completely dead over the Christmas New Year period. Uh, my colleague on this channel has got a review of Arcane, which is due to go out on Sunday. If you've seen it, then you're more in the know than I am. But I'm told it's very good. I'm also told the review is very good. So uh, keep in touch with that. That'll be on Sunday. I'm also going to do a proper video review of um, this this abomination that is Matrix Resurrections on Sunday as well. Should be out on Sunday on Boxing Day, which of course means I'm going to be spending some of my Christmas editing. But um, but there we are. The Matrix Resurrections, though, yeah. So I saw this, uh, literally just got back from the cinema about half an hour ago. And I don't remember the last time a film gave me a stress headache. Um, honestly. Honestly, oh, for... for Chat is one of um, Egan Sanders wonders what Arcane is. It's a series on Netflix animated series. Um, it's got rave reviews. It's supposed to be a background story to a game called League of Legends, but uh, it stands alone as a series. I've seen the first episode, and actually, it is it is really very good. Even I mean, my colleague who's reviewing it doesn't actually like anime very much, but he really enjoyed this. So it's it's definitely worth checking out. Well written, well crafted. Um, yeah, definitely Critical Drinker has recommended it. Critical Drinker has good taste. So um, I'm getting this out now, also partly to preempt him because um, i'm sure there'll be other better known reviewers doing uh, reviews of this this film but uh, yeah um so about half an hour ago got back and oh, it's just it's almost impossible to know where to start with the matrix resurrections i can't think of another film which is just it's so it's almost impossible to summarize so one of the reasons for doing this is I'm hoping to get some of my thoughts in order in before I go around and script a review. But just I uh, where where does where the hell do you begin? Um so yeah, I, I went I went into the film, I I'd seen a few sort of reviews before and I deliberately didn't read any of the reviews because I wanted to go in as objective as possible and I had a couple of beers and I thought, no, I'm gonna try my best to like this film. I'm not going to go in there and say, no, this is obviously going to be shit, um, because, of course, that might colour my reflections on this film. Um, so I went in there and I tried to like it. And let's see, let's, I mean, are there anything, is there anything that's emerged after the film that I still like? Ugh. No. I, I mean, no. <laughs> they they, they humanise, Neo and Trinity are a bit more human in this film. Um, than they are in the original, even, and certainly in the, the two subsequent sequels. That's all right, I guess. They're a bit more emotive. Um, it's not to say that their storyline is good, but the characters themselves are ever so slightly more relatable. You can tell I'm scraping the barrel here because because uh, I'm starting here. <laughs> um, a couple of the new characters had some promise. I think, is it Bugs, the main one with the blue hair, who wasn't as irritating as she looks that was good um some of the effects were nice some of them most of them very much not um i mean i've seen better things on tv and cheap tv at that um so but yeah that's mm. and for the first two minutes the callbacks the reflections the um the the nostalgia baiting which is what it became very quickly afterwards but that at least when you first start the film, you think, oh, that's um, that's a little bit, that's not quite what I was expecting, the meta-commentary. The meta-commentary, though, I mean, the only useful bit of meta-commentary in this entire film, and this film is, ha half of this film is meta, and the other half, well, at least a third of it again is, um, you know, a third of it again is just flashbacks, I mean, direct flashbacks to the preceding films. And then the remaining third, um, if I've done my fractions correctly, is um, not quite, but the remaining, whatever is left, um, is devoted to new material. The uh, only really useful piece of meta commentary, though, is the one right at the beginning. So Neo is in therapy. There are going to be spoilers, I should say, in this. Um, if you don't, if you haven't seen the film, if you want to see the film, you shouldn't. But if you haven't seen the film and you do want to see the film and you don't want spoilers, 
how you can spoil this film, I don't know. But stop here, because there will be spoilers henceforth. Um, Neo is in therapy. He's got his, um, his therapist is Neil Patrick Harris. This is a terrible casting move for reasons we shall come on to. But um, for now, he's just a therapist. And um, there's this, this comment, I think, is made in, in this session about... Because uh, he has to try and restart the video game. The Matrix in this new version is a video game. Everything that happened before is a video game that he... Neo created within the Matrix. You can see how convoluted this already is. That's the premise. He is back in the Matrix. He is a head of a video game company. He created best-selling video games, the Matrix, uh, back in the day. And the studio, owned by Warner Brothers, which the film directly mentions, is forcing them to do a sequel. And if you know any of the backstory about Warner Brothers' attempts to get the Wachowskis to do another Matrix film after Revolutions, um, you can this this is pretty overt and it does make you wonder whether the entire thing isn't just one big meta commentary on on the studio because the studio has tried almost every single year since revolutions came out in the early 2000s that was wasn't it to get them to do another one they've always been disinterested by it you can tell they've been disinterested by it because they've pawned off subsequent story development to other media to occasional comics i think but certainly to video games this has problems um we'll come on to again because Things that happen in video games are officially canonical within the Matrix universe, which means this film is starting from a position that you will only know about if you've played fairly obscure video games, and it doesn't make sense, really, unless you have. I haven't, and for the, pe the majority of the audience won't have done so. And so to compensate for this, the film attempts to get around it with exposition. This explains why Morpheus has been recast, for instance. Um, he is in one of the video games, I think, killed by some mechanical flies he's assassinated and so the film this film that being canonical has to begin with um with the idea that uh yeah morpheus is dead and they try very clumsily subsequently to um to explain the reasons for this um there are many problems with this but the meta commentary being i think on on the studio the the only piece of useful meta commentary the rest of the film is there's lots of meta commentary it's meta commentary on the t a certain type of fan the wachowskis really don't like a certain kind of fan um it's a meta commentary on the state of modern film but and and there like there is this new development in like you have the agents in the original matrix obviously as principal villains in this uh you have bots because obviously you have to have bots if you're making any comment on a internet culture. Um, I will come on to what I want to see, um, Mr. Sanders, if you don't mind. I, I will come on to that because, yeah, I was asked about this in the car on the way back. And I think without rewriting the whole film is difficult. But I'll try and do this. I will try and do it. Um, I'll try and think on it as I, as I try and set the rest of the thoughts in order. But... Uh, so you have bots in this film as well, as, as you must do if you're having any internet co commentary on internet culture. Bots are called, you know, they scream and they screech and they're activated by whatever villain that you have, the, the obligatory villain the series must have, again, onto which we shall come because the villain choices in this film are terrible. Um, so you get all of this meta stuff, but otherwise the only useful thing is just this comment on the studio they directly name warner brothers as well like quite often you get meta commentary i think jurassic world did this when they talked about how no one wants to see normal dinosaurs anymore all the all the the money is in new things and if all the cor big corporations who of course fund the film are wanting new bigger better flashier but in jurassic world and in most other films which though they take money from big studios they're obliged to hate on big studios because capitalism uh, doesn't name the studio in question in this film it does it actually names warner brothers and um that feels pretty much pretty on the nose and i think it does go somewhere toward explaining why the rest of the film is as it is um if we come on to more of the film itself though so i didn't want to have to do this because relying on wikipedia for anything is bad but the plot in this film is it's so ridiculous it's so convoluted it, it's so nonsensical, and it's thrown at you so quickly that it's 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 all. I find it incredibly difficult to keep track of, and I like long and complicated things, um, but this film just makes no sense. And so I'm going to have to rely on this at least to prompt me with a couple of bits. I like the fact that at the top here, by the way, it says that the plot summary may be too long or excessively detailed. That is not a problem with the plot summary. That is a problem with the plot. The film is two and a half hours long, and it. It doesn't have that much material in it. It shouldn't be. Um, so the basic idea, I mean, as we said, he's a video game director, video game developer. He's been told he has to um, 
he has to create a sequel. He doesn't want to. Uh, he has trouble separating his dreams from reality. So he's seeing this therapist and he has to take blue pills, which is a very obvious callback, as you'd expect. That's a forgivable one, though, given that the pills are iconic. It's an unforgivable one when we come on, as we will shortly, to consider some of the critics' responses who focus solely on the political uses this, to which this film might be put, like reclaiming the red pill. But Neo is taking blue pills to supposedly help keep him sane. But um, it's sort of hinted at that he's refused medication before. He starts refusing it again. He starts supposedly at least hallucinating. Um, and he uh, this causes him all kinds of visions, all kinds of flashbacks to the film. Again, I've mentioned that half this film is flashback. It is flashback, and it's not... It's not just callback, it's direct flashback. You are seeing direct scenes from the previous Matrix films, um, which just really make you think, why am I not sitting at home watching those? Because I could do that for free. Even 2 and 3, even 2 and 3 make more sense than this film. Why have I paid money to see this? These are better. Even even 3. Even, and 3 is not good. 3 is, um, three is also not good for the plot, because this film actually, it, it completely ignores the events of 3. But again, I think we'll come on to these reasons. But, um, so it, this is where it starts becoming complex. So as best I can recall, and I'm going to try and do this blindly without looking at Wikipedia, um, Neo is, he has created what is called, I think, a modal or a nodal within the code of the game version of the Matrix that he built, where he creates a new version of Morpheus. And this version of Morpheus combines both Morpheus and Agent Smith in a bid to convince Neo that the version of the Matrix he is currently living in is not the real world. I think that's how this goes. And the film begins with our new blue-haired character, Bugs, um, in this modal, looking for old code, and we see Trinity's original fight scene from the first film, as she, uh, the, the, sort of the, the famous opening shot with her sitting on the chair, um, and the guards enter and she fights them off. This trinity has been recast for reasons. Um, and so Bugs is trying to find Neo's code through the code of the modal, and she gets ambushed by agents, and one of the agents is Morpheus, and then she escapes them, and then Morpheus catches her, but then they have a bit of conversation, and he says, well, she, she, goes, she does her whole, I realize this world isn't real thing, and then he says, yeah, me too. And then she gets him out of the Matrix. And, um, and, uh, yeah, cut back to, to Neo again, I think, after this. They, they have to, they find him. They, um, th there's a couple of more flashbacks again. Neo's going through therapy again. He's at work. There's some kind of alarm. Something happens. Uh, they have to run away, but he gets a text on, on his smartphone, which is mirroring the call he received from Morpheus in the original Matrix. Um, and, so he follows the instructions, he meets not Morpheus, discount Morpheus, budget Morpheus, replacement Morpheus, whatever you want to call him. And then there's a fight scene. And th this this is where some of the, the, the craft problems with the film begin, because even with like, The Matrix Reloaded and The Matrix Revolutions, you can forgive to an extent the problems with story they have, because they are at least visually striking. You shouldn't forgive the problems with story, but you can at least overlook them at times, and they encourage you to over them, because they are visually striking, and they are technically quite well put together, especially in the fight scenes. If the Wachowskis do anything well, it's a fight scene. Well, I think the, the, the Wachowski most often involved in fight scenes is the one who didn't return for this film, which was a bad sign from the off when only one of them thought it was worth making, because the fight scenes in this film are really... they're really tame. They're not Matrix standard. They're not Matrix style. There's none of the care, there's none of the craft or attention to detail. There's none of the complexity in them. Matrix fight scenes are famously very out there. They're, they're quite, well, they are by definition unreal. They're surreal at the very least, uh, because that, that is the point of the Matrix. In this film, though, we know age, we know Neo, we know um, Keanu Reeves can still do this stuff, because we've seen him in other films where fighting is required. Um, he is it's John Wick, isn't it, of course, that he plays most famously at the moment. So it's not as though he can't move in these ways anymore. And some of the younger actors have been in films where they've done this stuff as well. But in this you get, there's a couple of flips in the opening fight scene in the office. And that's basically it. That there's like, for some, most of the gunfight even is Morpheus or fake Morpheus standing still. And 
shooting at shooting at the, all the mass legions of cops who who turn up. With, uh, apparently, the, the police though they're shooting submachine guns at him are more in they, they're less accurate than stormtroopers because though this guy's standing still, they just miss him the entire goddamn time. Um, and it just looks unimaginative. It looks really it looks dull. It's slow. It's just tedious. And of course, yeah, Neo has pointed out in chat very well. Remember, doesn't actually use guns at all. I don't think at all in this film. Um, it's just Morpheus fighting them off at this point. Now, unless I'm wrong, I might be wrong, because I think this is the minute where uh, Agent Smith is back and recast for the first time. Is that right? Um, the the boss of his video game company is actually Agent Smith, but he's played by, uh, what's his name, Mr. Gruff from um, Mindhunter on Netflix, which is a really good series. But he's the most annoying thing in it because he's really sort of feeble and weak and autistically detached from things. He's like a, a Vulcan. Um, in this film, he's hamming it up a bit, but he doesn't have any presence. And he's really not helped by the fact that they keep cutting back to images from the older Matrix films of uh, Hugo Weaving, who actually does have presence and charisma on screen. But th this new version of Agent Smith is just thrown in. Oh, it's Agent Smith. How do we know this Agent Smith? Well, we're told it's Agent Smith, so that's that's it. That's good enough for us. Uh, and it's played by this this new relatively metrosexual type. Uh, it's just it's really unconvincing. And then they have a bit of a fight thing. Yeah, that's it. They come in when the sprinklers come off, and then they have a bit of a fight. They escape, and Neo refuses to. Uh, we, we first refuses to accept that he's in the Matrix again, but then he accepts it, and he's going to leave. Um, and so he agrees to be extracted. So then we get another of the big callbacks. You know, obviously everyone remembers, and it is an iconic scene for a reason. That part in in the original Matrix film, where ne Neo does first wake up in the real world in the pods, and you get the at the time quite iconic panoramic shot, um, which is really limited in that film because the budget was relatively limited, but it's very well used. Uh, when the panoramic of the the huge racks and racks of parts and the giant machines that are harvesting them, Neo wakes up in another one of these. It's almost scene for scene repeated. The only difference here being that Neo is one of only two parts facing opposite each other. Um, and he is rescued this time. He's not flushed down a tube. Uh, he's lifted out by machines. Uh, and these machines, you know, are a bit different from, um, they're a little bit different from the usual one. They're not the Sentinels, who barely feature, which barely feature in this film at all. They're much more sort of organically designed, much smoother, much lighter, much happier looking, much more animalistic almost. Um, and these, these come back later on in other forms, and uh, not for good reasons <laughs> at all. It's no, um... So he's he's lifted out. He's taken by the machines down uh, into the new ship, which is the Nemesini, isn't it? Um, um, oh God, Greek pronunciation. Nemosini, I think it is. Is the new ship. Then they go through the whole usual thing. But rather than putting him in the um, as near in the original Matrix film, has to be put in the bed. He has to be fought with needles um, to rebuild his muscular strength and all the rest. Rather than that, no. Apparently, he's dying for reasons. The only way to stop him dying is to put him into the constructs where he meets not Morpheus again. Not Morpheus takes him to a dojo in the middle of a very pretty scenery somewhere in the middle of lakes. They have a, an aborted fight scene. He kicks Neo's ass a bit. Then Neo gets angry and uses the force. And then he's back and alive and it's all good. Back to the ship. And I'm, I'm still trying to ignore Wikipedia for this. So I'm gonna, at some point I'll forget and I'll have to carry on. Um... Yeah, conservative propaganda, that's an interesting one. I, what, the, this Matrix is conservative propaganda. I'll, I'll have to look into I will look into that presently. Um, so we're back on the ship anyway. Uh, it, Morpheus is not, um, is not, however, limited to the construct, and he's not limited to the Matrix, though he is a program, because in this world, the only uh, reference it really makes to the outcome of the last film, where there is peace struck between man and machines, is that... Men and machines are to some extent working together now, which, and technology has of course evolved, it's been 60 years apparently since uh, Neo first disappeared at the end of revolutions. And so this means that his, his cutesy monster robots that rescued him are on the ship and they help out, they have names, I don't remember them because they aren't, they build as characters but they're not, they don't do anything apart from that. And they're strong... If you've seen The Last Jedi, there are strong Porg vibes with a few of them. They are way too cutesy. They're just there for memes and cutesiness and 
why. But Morpheus is another one because they have nanotech, and nanotech allows people to form, uh, or allows programs to form in the real world. So he sort of is he's this metal monster thing. He's created of metal nanobytes, met, uh, nanomachines. Looks sort of vaguely powdery, but is physical. It's explained when you when you first see him that it allows them to form in the real world, but with strict and severe limitations. They can only do so much. It's never said what those strict and severe limitations are, though, on their practicality and their functionality, which is really handy for the film, because toward the end of the film, it needs these limitations not to exist. And it helps that they didn't um, they didn't define them. So later on in the film, Morpheus is in the real world, but unrestricted, unlimited. Um, yeah, and it's just cheap, lazy, yeah. Um... I'll pause on the plot briefly because this point on um, conservative propaganda uh, is it? That's an interesting one. I have not seen Tim Pool's um, review or his whatever he said on this. Enforces the concept of matriarch and patriarch being necessary. Yeah, uh, you can kind of see that. Um, I think that would be a pretty superficial analysis, though, given that she leaves her husband and children to go back with Neo. Uh, that seems to be a bit unconservative to me. Um, Maybe that is just me. I, I always thought divorce is a fairly anti-conservative. To be honest, as far as the politics of the film go, I was fairly pleasantly surprised in that this was the thing that everybody expected to hate about it. Everyone worried that the Bachowskis now having claimed retroactively that the original trilogy was about trans issues, they being so vocal about trans issues now, we know from the trailers there's people with blue hair who look faintly androgynous and the Bachowskis' politics are pretty toxic. I thought, along with a lot of other people, that there would be way too much politicking in the film and that that would be the real problem. It might have a half-decent story, but it would be completely lost by the pretty nasty politics of the thing. To be honest, I didn't see any politics really in this one. Not much, until very near the end when they've run out of other things to do. I was pleasantly surprised by the fact that they hadn't gone in for this stuff. And what ruined the film was not what I expected to ruin the film. That was, um... That was new. That was unexpected. Um... But as far as the matriarch and the patriarch, yes, I, I think loosely that could be said to be conservative, but I do think it is undermined by a lot of the other stuff. I don't think it's a massively political film. I think for them to have made it a political film, they'd have had to care about it, and it's not at all clear to me that they cared enough about this film to even bother making it political. Um, anyway, so the other pod, I mentioned that Neo wakes up, and there's two pods, as opposed to the massed ranks that we do see them elsewhere at one point. The other pod contains trinity and we'll come back then to the matriarch and patriarch point because they completely redo the idea of the one in this film um neo is not the one neo cannot act independently of trinity as the one together they are one which given that the first film is quite heavy on sort of gnostic christianity and similar and sort of those similar philosophical themes plato's dualism of souls um you can you can see a philosophical justification for that, which is not entirely removed from the original films, but I think the fact is it is practically and functionally removed from the original films because the, the, this arrangement, this relationship, was never set out in this way in one, two, or three. It does that seems like well, we need female hero, so let's let's inflate Trinity a little bit, and she in the end is the one who can do all of the uh, the magical stuff. Um, I wasn't sure if it was the message was that she was the one. I just think it's that they are both the one. But maybe I'm wrong about that. Uh, Neo still has some of his powers, so they're diminished. Um, Trinity has some of his powers that he no longer has. Um, I So I think, from what I recall, uh, what my takeaway from anyway was that this idea is that the one is not one, the one is at least two, if not many. That would kind of fit again with the philosophical underpinning of the original films, but it would also change the functionality of the thing, and that breaks with continuity. But this film doesn't really care very much about continuity. So later on, as the exposition starts, because it's a Matrix film, there has to be some, uh, we, we, learn, we learn through the conversations with Neo in the real world now as he uh, talks to Bugs on the ship and as they return to not Zion this time, but Io, which is a new city, ruled by... Who's Jada Pinkett Smith's character in the original films? Niobe. Captain Niobe, who is now General Niobe. She is still Jada Pinkett Smith. Jada Pinkett Smith in real life is not um is not old in real life. Not that old in real life. She's not 60 years old in real life. So they've sort of daubed her up in old person makeup, like Guy Pearce in Prometheus. And I don't know if there's something about old person prosthetics that forces people to bend their backs in the same way or speak with the same creaky voice. 
but this seems to happen every time they try and old someone up. I don't really see why they couldn't have, um, why they couldn't have just cast an old actress. I mean, surely that's better for representation. But no, flashbacks, callbacks, nostalgia, you have to cast the originals. That's, um, that's pretty much, that's the only reason I can think of. Um, but it's explained by exposition anyway. So there was peace. This is, this is when the film tries to make itself of accord of peace with the events of the last one, of revolutions, when, of course, Neo sacrifices himself to create peace between man and machines, the civil war ends, blah, blah, blah. And then you get the hackneyed dialogue at the end of that film between the architect and the oracle. Um, talking about the new arrangement, the new matrix will be set up, it'll be different, the relationship will be much more you know, pleasant between man and machine, and it's all good. If via exposition and a couple of vaguely Terminator-esque flashbacks in Resurrections, we learn that... Um, it turns out depriving the machines of half their original power source uh, meant that the cities couldn't power themselves. So the machines went to war with each other. That, I assume, explains why you get the creation of the really lovable kind of Porg-type machines that help them out. These machines are then outcast when, I assume, one... It's not really clearly stated, but one assumes one particular faction won this civil war of the machines. Outcast the factions that like the humans. That's why all of them look cutesy and all of the other ones still use Sentinels. Um... And Zion was led by Morpheus. Morpheus apparently was stuck in the past and he couldn't see that he'd been trapped in his own kind of matrix though in the real world because he was, you know, he believed in the one, the power of the one of Nero, that the prophecy of Nero was true. And no matter what was happening with the civil war between the man and the machines, uh, peace would win out, peace in our time. And it's heavily implied that Zion is gone in some way and Morpheus is dead, as we know. Um... But otherwise, I mean, this is a really unsatisfying way of attempting to explain the state of things as they are, though. It just doesn't wash. You could make something really good of this. Going back to the question asked near the beginning about, you know, what would I like to have seen? You can do stuff with this. There is a lot in the backstory of The Matrix, and there's a lot you can do by inference that would actually make this particular part of the backstory work. You could even start with this, but you certainly should give it much more... Um, you should give it much more... Uh, attention than is given in this film. You can't really do away with this just by exposition. It's so lazy. Oh, uh, this, yeah, Morpheus is dead, by the way, and Zion's gone, and uh, the Matrix is still a thing, and everything that you did in the last film, all that big story arc that you com thought you'd completed, yeah, didn't really, didn't really achieve anything, and now we're back. Um, it just doesn't work. But, um, so, uh, what's her name? Bugs going after Neo it very much irritates Niobe. Niobe doesn't want this to happen. And she strips her of her command because, again, reasons. There's this really quickly manufactured animosity that ideally you have at least one scene to explain and explore it. But no, it's just you did wrong and therefore you're gone. And she, said, she makes some vague reference to the fact that uh, Bugs is vaguely and generally rebellious. Um, they sort of hint at some kind of past relationship between these two. As though one is the protege and one is the uh, aging master or mistress, but it just doesn't come off that way because it's about two seconds of dialogue. So she's removed from her command. Neo is imprisoned, again for reasons, and he's imprisoned on a nice big high tower with a balcony overlooking it, which really conveniently has a drain pipe down which slinks machine Morpheus. <laughs> um... Because remember the limitations that they said happened? Uh, no, there aren't any of those. And he tells Neo that already, despite having just been stripped of command, Bugs is back on a ship, they're going to rescue him, they're going to go and get Trinity. Um, so that's it, that, that's fine. They go off, Jada Pinkett Smith is annoyed, she sends someone after them, they get to them, do they? I think they get to This is where I'm going to have to rely on Wikipedia again, because, I mean, i completely forgotten what happens in this film. I saw it about an hour ago. Um, they entered, that was it. So, yeah, oh, and of course it's vaguely explained that they resurrected Neo and Trinity for reasons, again. Just, ugh, why? It, 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 this is, it doesn't explain satisfactorily why. Apparently, for some reason, these guys, the Trinity and Neo, are the basis on which the new version of the Matrix is predicated. But it's not really... That's just a contrivance. That's not a plot. That's not a story. That's just a thing. Um, it, it's really unsatisfying, essentially. Um, so, 
after we get this anyway so they go they go back into the matrix they go into the matrix again with neo and bugs and the rest of the crew and they are met by this is this is where this is where the film just looks like a video game you can tell they're going by numbers they are just going through the motions we need as many callbacks to previous characters as we can here is a scene which is relatively empty at the moment they're just walking down some stairs what do we do throw in a boss battle and the boss battle is the Merovingian from 2 and some of his other outcasts who are now outcasts the Merovingian is now a hobo he's scruffy he hates the modern world he hates the new matrix it's deprived him of his style and his class you can kind of detect another meta comment here on the state of modern film of modern remakes of the desire for modern film and modern remakes um but within the structure of the film itself it's just again it's so contrived all this is is just it's an excuse to throw in another thing remember that guy it's member berry construction that's what it is just member berries from south park remember the merovingian remember the vampire people oh and then smith bursts in but of course he's not smith because he's the guy from um the guy from mindhunter and then they have a big fight and he tries to do a version of Smith. He is hamming it up a little bit, but he lacks, again, he lacks Hugo Weaving's strength, his charisma. He lacks any kind of basics of a backstory. Bear in mind, it's been, what, 20 odd years since the last Matrix film, since we last saw Agent Smith. As far as we all knew, he was dead. He was blown up by Neo. That was a condition of his winning the peace with the machines. You can't just throw him back on screen as an unrecognizable actor with different mannerisms and no set out motivation and expect people not to feel that that's jarring and you also can't do it with an actor who has no presence or like or any real menace to him he's i maybe he is a versatile actor but he sort of camps this up uh, you know he talks about how he's been remade in a, in a newer flashier way to uh, represent the newer flashier version of the matrix that everyone now lives in but says something like, maybe maybe they went too far with the piercing blue eyes what do you think um no no, no i think they just went too far with your casting mate i just don't think that works at all um it's it's just bad big fight scene and they fight off the merovingian's thugs the merovingian because he's just a video game boss and it's not technically the boss level yet just disappears and uh smith not smith is beating up neo he's winning and then neo does the force again and wins that's that um so they fight the exiles off and then he start yeah so this is sort of near recovering his his previous abilities but they're quite tame in comparison to what they used to be and then um then they go to meet not trinity in this film but tiffany tiffany has neo has met her at a coffee shop before she has a husband she has kids she doesn't remember any of this either she doesn't she has vague flashbacks senses that dreams are more than dreams and neo is immediately in love with her of course and then so they go to meet her it's explained she still likes motorbikes that's a thing they go to meet her in a repair shop and neo tries to convince her to come out of the matrix but his psychoanalyst appears the psychoanalyst is neil patrick harris and the reason i said earlier that neil patrick harris was a terrible casting choice for this is that the analyst, more so than Agent Smith, is the big bad in this film. He is the villain of this film. He is the replacement for the architect. He's known as the analyst. Because this version of The Matrix has a different approach to humanity. The architect is characterized as having been obsessed with numbers and schematics and equations. And the analyst takes a more psychological interest in the lives of people, learns how to keep them suppressed by lying to them. And then you get the first of a few different diatribes against the state of the modern populace and especially the modern politic uh, when he goes on about how all the people enjoy being lied to and how it's so easy to manipulate them etc 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 if you were wearing a MAGA hat I it would not be much less subtle than this uh, but Neil Patrick Harris is not a villainous actor he's not again he has not got the presence he has not got the versatility he has not got the the uh, the menace factor I just it just it's just crap why why do they do this um i've just been told to pause to realize how silly it is to explain the movie yeah yeah this is this is the problem with this this is why i'm having to rely on wikipedia um like this plot makes no sense does it it's not just me i'm sure it's not just me i went to see it funnily enough with my mum 
and her friend, and they said they really they they liked it. They they thought it was just um, they thought it was they uh, I don't know. They liked the Trinity Neo stuff. They thought it was exciting, and I said yeah, okay maybe, but this doesn't explain the the story. You must admit makes no sense. And they said, well, no, no, it answers all the questions. It asks the questions. It answers the questions. What? But I couldn't name a question that it had asked or a question that it had answered. Um, it's just... Uh, uh, this, it, uh, yeah, it makes no sense. I mean, trying to read... I, I, could, I could read this from Wikipedia just word for word and it would make no goddamn sense. Um, so they're in the Matrix again. They find Trinity. The fucking Neil Patrick Harris turns up, and he is the only person now with command of bullet time, because references and nostalgia. Remember bullet time? That was fun. Neo can't do it anymore. There's a really long, irritating scene where he plays with time, and he's moving quickly, and everyone else is moving slowly, and he turns one of Trinity's, oh, sorry, Tiffany's helpers into one of the the bots and then they shoot a gun and there's the long scene where the bullet goes toward tiffany's head and neo can't do anything about it um and then at the very last minute the uh not the architects no the analyst stops the bullet and uh just <laughs> it's sort of explained yeah the the analyst his idea is that you can achieve balance if you keep in the real like this makes no sense you can have a balanced matrix if you have trinity and neo near each other in the real world but not with each other because if you put them with each other then bad things happen so that's why they are in two pods near each other but like like what <laughs> no the architect had a good sensible plan for this and this film cheapens the architect by dismissing all of his stuff as just numbers and equations. The architect actually goes into... The dialogue is incredibly dense, and almost parodically so. But the architect explains how the version of The Matrix that existed in 1999, was it? Existed. How the original one was too unstable. How the one was created to give balance to it. In part to give balance to it. How patterns and repetition create balance and not perfection and this sort of this makes sense this the architect's version to the extent anything makes sense in the matrix makes sense dismissing that as just numbers is cheapening the original character um they're interrupted anyway well once i don't even remember how the analyst disappears but he disappears they're interrupted by the people that niobe sent to track them they're taken out of the matrix again but then they have to go back into the Matrix because they decide that it's, res it's worth rescuing Trinity after all. Another haul back to the thing where Niobe asks for volunteers and everyone steps forward. And then, I mean, I don't even... Like, how do you explain the last bit? So, girl from the train in 2, um, who gets on uh, with her father, she's back in the form in the real world of some kind of... It's like Mothra from Godzilla, but robot. Slash a manta ray. And then in the in the construct version, the Matrix version, she is yeah, she's a little Indian girl, but she's all grown up. And then she kind of explains how you can go about getting the MacGuffin that is Trinity, and it involves much like the second one, you have to split teams off, some in the Matrix, some out of the Matrix. You have to. I mean, oh God, I how I might just have to go purely from Wikipedia for this because I can't. So Wikipedia says this is impossible to explain. So Neo demands the analyst release Trinity if she decides to be freed from the Matrix, agreeing to return to the Matrix himself if she declines. The analyst agrees. Trinity as Tiffany is brought to them. This is, this is by the way, quite late on, because you've also got this whole subplot thing in the real world where, the, where Mothra and robot Morpheus, um, they have to go, and also Bugs, have to go to the Machine City to find real Trinity ready to unplug her from the Matrix, but in a way that allows her to stay in the Matrix by reconnecting her head plug to bugs. And this, like, what the hell? This makes no sense. <laughs> it's impossible to explain this film. This film is abysmal. I just, no, 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 no. Um, then you get to the point that Wikipedia is here attempting to explain. They meet the analyst in a room which is just full of police and soldier people. And 
they have this conversation. Tiffany is brought in. Her family appears to try and keep her in the Matrix. The last second... Well, she says she she agrees to go with them. So Neo lies down and prepares to be done up the wrong one with one of those brain plugs, I assume, and put back into the Matrix. And then Trinity decides that she hates being called Tiffany and changes her mind. And then there's a fight. And then the analyst tries to kill them, but Smith is back. They will try and escape. They get on motorbikes. They go ahead of bugs. Then you get the whole thing with the bots again, and like there's this really, really I it's I thought in the it's one of those laugh out loud scenes that you suddenly realise is actually pretty damn disgusting. So there's the bots, which is just everyone in the city at this point. I think controlled by Smith. It's not really clear because Smith shoots the uh, analyst who disappears who has a cat called fucking Deja Vu, by the way. And that was pretty... And in case you missed that, that vitally important reference. The bots come... But they start turning the bots up in apartment buildings into bots, and they're making them jump out of windows, like they're committing suicide, onto the road below to try and stop cars. And the line, the literal word for word, I remember this line, they're turning them into bombs. Like, suicide people being used as bombs launching themselves off of buildings to try and stop fast-moving cars and motorbikes. And at the time, it's like, oh my fucking god. This is this is just hilarious. And then also, yeah, but also quite disgusting. They, the Wachowskis have previous with this, by the way. The Wachowskis' politics are toxic. They do not worry about this kind of thing. V for Vendetta, if you guys did a review on this a couple of months ago. No, it can't be that long. We've been going for a month. A month ago. If you go back and look at the politics and the political messaging of V for Vendetta, which was another Wachowski film, it's pretty disgusting. I mean, the really overt false flag references in a film that's designed to be a social commentary on 9-11, for instance. That's pretty, pretty dark and unpleasant. And this isn't actually as extreme or bad as that, but it's still pretty nasty. Anyway, surprisingly enough, making people jump off of buildings onto cars doesn't stop anything. So they carry on. There's some helicopters that shoot at them. They shoot missiles at them. There's some Neo does his power thing and throws the missiles around. They somehow end up on a roof. Lots of shooting. Um, it's implied that they're fucked. So they go to jump off the building. And then Neo... They are falling. Neo can't fly anymore. Then they are flying. And he's dangling there. And he says... Um, I'm not doing this, and she says, well, it's me, and, like, yeah, so now she's the one who can fly. Yes, in answer to chat, only one of the Machowskis made this film, and only one of them wrote it as well. They had a couple of other writers involved. One of them, I think, was Matt, I want to say not Matt Smith. Um, uh, maybe it was. No, they have a couple of other writers anyway, um, but only one of the Machowskis was actually involved in this. I think the other one might have been executive producing, but that's basically it. Anyway, the implication being now that uh, Neo and Trinity are either the one together or Trinity is the one. I think it's the former, but uh, you might you might have thought that they could have ended it there, um, and that would have been abysmal, but at least it would have ended, and that would have come as a relief. But they didn't, because they go back to meet the analyst again, and in a sort of, this is sort of, I don't know if it was intended as a meta-commentary on the film itself, but it could well have been, and probably should have been, so Trinity just kills the analyst several times. At one point she punches his jaw off, but then at a snap of her fingers, um, he's back alive. And then she kills him a different way, and she snaps her fingers and he's back alive. And she kills him a different way, and she snaps his, and she snaps her fingers and he's back alive. And um, and then this is kind of this is just the film. This, this is what the film feels like. Just make it end. Put it out of its goddamn misery. Stop bringing it back. This is just pathetic. And then they fly off together, and the, they say that they're starting something new. They come to change the world. Which was the point of the first film. We haven't got anywhere. It renders the third film completely redundant. Neo's whole story arc is made redundant by this film. And it's a testament to how bad the rest of the film is. Writing-wise, plot-wise, structure... Even the fight scenes, the special, the effects, I suppose I'd say special effects, but they really don't look special. They look pretty crap. Um, it's just, everything is bad. And it's testament to how bad this film is that the way they ruin the film, 
the, the way they ruin the previous films even is not the most objectionable thing about it it's the rest of it that's the most objectionable thing about it it's just it's just it's i i honestly think this is probably the worst film i've made on a technical level there are other other i've seen sorry on a technical level um there are other films which have done worse so some i heard some people say before the film that they were going to do to this film what the last jedi did to star wars it didn't do that partly because star wars wasn't already in the bin um, when the film came out it doesn't make it its point to wreck what went before it it doesn't break the preceding films it just kind of ignores them where it can get away with it but as on a technical level the film is worse the film is worse than The Last Jedi on a technical level just the way it's constructed the way it's written the way it's put together it's just it is a, abysmal it is abysmal as a film and um, now I've come to the end of the fucking insane plot summary I'm going to have to take some glass of water. And then because that film is incredibly painful, I'm also going to have to sip some whiskey. And now we can come on to... um, um Yeah, someone in chat says your butt cheeks would have been walking their way off the chair to get you to leave in protest. Again, it's testament to how bad this film is that the one thing I was really aware of, besides the building stress pressure headache I was getting, was that from half an hour in, my ass was aching like hell. It was really uncomfortable. Um, and ideally, a good film doesn't make you consider your own ass for the bulk of a two-hour run. This film did. Um, just, oh, my God. But anyway, we've done the plot summary. It's, as you can tell, insane if you haven't seen it yet. Honestly, sometimes there are films which I think, like like the, the Star Wars sequels, they're shit, but you should probably see them just to see what they do wrong and how they ruin a good franchise. But this film, I'm not even sure it's worth seeing it. It doesn't do anything. You won't have missed out on any major cultural moment if you don't go and see it. It's just pointless. It, it's, what's the point? And you can sort of tell this because I, I've, since this, like I had about half an hour um, when I got back from the cinema before this stream started, and I had to go through, I wanted to go through and find good reviews, find some positive reviews, see if they'd said anything that I'd missed, see if there was anything about this film that I'd missed that actually would have changed my opinion. I had to put a lot of effort into finding a positive, anyone saying a positive thing about this film. Even the usual suspects hate this film. Like um, IGN, IGN gave Star Wars The Last Jedi 9.7. That's an abysmal film. IGN quite liked, um, what's that? Or Santa Inc., which is just like, it's the film equivalent of the Holocaust. IGN gave this film a bad review. A four. That it's a bunch of really good ideas stacked together to make a bad and sometimes ugly film. IGN hates this film. Um, the review was not bad, actually. It's, it's by, um, is this the one there? Wrong one again, going through the links. Uh, Amelia Emberwing. It's it's not that long, but she's like, just you know, there are good parts. As I think I mentioned at the top, like humanizing Keanu Reeves and Carrie Ann Moss um, helps a little bit. But yeah, this person seems to like as Jonathan Groff. That's the guy from um, I've remembered his name, and now I'm going to forget the series. Uh, Mind Hunter. She seems to think that he eats up every scene he's in as Smith. He really doesn't. I mean, it's just, it's just bad. An exaltation of thoughtless mediocrity was the title for another review. That was that was re that was a good line. Um, <laughs> that was that was a very good line. I wish I'd written it myself. Um, but you know, she says that the Matrix Resurrection is made up almost entirely of good ideas, but it's not a good movie. It's a bunch of individually neat ideas stacked in a trench coat, uh, like a bunch of kids trying to buy a ticket to an R-rated film. Cleverness is met with laughably bad execution at nearly every turn. The story uh, metaness is a problem, as we've said. We're not going to go through all of that again. But she's, you know, the attempt at deep meta commentary comes at the expense of the fight scenes, for instance. As we've said, the fight scenes are pretty dull, tedious. Um, the only successful plot points within the Matrix Reservation are Neo and Trinity's undying love story and the film's expansion of, to franchise lore. I don't even think it succeeds in that. It doesn't really add anything to the lore that they, the games or any of the books that probably came around alongside have done. Um, it just cheapens all of it. And it ruins the major plot lines of the last films, as we've said. It's just like no like, but again this this is a this is a relatively nice review it gave it four out of ten but even she has to conclude the matrix resurrection is the kind of film that will go down in cult history because it's so laughably bad 
And that's pretty much accurate. Even The Guardian hated it. The Matrix is drained of life by the Hollywood machine. Um, who else have we got? Uh, USA Today. Even Keanu Reeves' Neo can't save the remixed results of The Matrix Resurrections. Um, the Verge. Uh, what have we got? It's more interested in being self-aware than being good. So these, I've moved into some of the better reviews, actually, here. Yeah, <laughs> Undying Love Story. Yes, chat. Uh, George Lucas does significantly better love stories than this. And George Lucas's love stories make you want to poke nails in your own eyelids. But um, he does better better love stories than this. But uh, So I'm moving on anyway. To, like, these are some of the more positive reviews. I said I'd try to find some. But even the positive reviews are usually qualified. So this one, like, it's more interested in being self-aware than in being good, for instance. Um, uh, it's, it's, you know, it warned me its existence was a bad idea and I kept watching anyway. I have nobody but myself to blame. This is true. Well, you should have walked out after the bit at the beginning when they say that it's the studio forcing them to make it. Um, yeah, it, it is only, it's Lana Wachowski um, is the only one who was involved with it. Starts with an intriguing bit of metatextual loopiness before devolving into a tepid sequel. It's a gratingly uncool and reactive cut-up of an effortlessly cool and timeless work, albeit seemingly deliberately so. It seeks to dissect the adulation and mythos that have grown up and around the Matrix over 22 years, but without the masterful craft work that inspired the adulation in the first place. And worst of all, the Kung Fu isn't very good. And it really isn't. The Kung Fu is not really Kung Fu. At one point, Neo says, because again, you have callbacks, every, literally every other scene is a callback, and at one point, Neo does one of his superpower force move things, and blows some people away and he says i still know kung fu but the move he just did is not in kung fu as far as i'm aware you can't use the force in kung fu you, you could have used some actual kung fu and said that line but not then that's not that's not a thing um no it's, it's astonishing that the matrix of all things could let the let the fight scenes drop like this there's hardly any wire work there's no especially good moves the only person who really uses any kung fu is not morpheus at the beginning in the not bodega thing when they are be trying to revive neo by punching him repeatedly in the face that's the only time but it's just and it's just yeah and it's, it's don't mean any of these this is the who wrote this at the verge addy robertson says, um, you know, he doesn't mean it's some abstract thematic way. Resurrection's narrative is very directly responding to decades of people analysing everything from the Matrix's bullet time sequences to its transgender subtext. Yeah, in a sense, but it doesn't actually say anything about the transgender subtext itself. That's the interesting thing. The politics isn't ru what ruins this film. If anything, you just get the sense that the Wachowski, the Wachowski who was involved in this, Lana Wachowski, is just tired of people trying to analyse it this way. But if that's true, then she shouldn't have gone about inviting people to say that it is a trans allegory in the first place. Because there was never any of this stuff at the beginning. Um, just, no. It, no. Nah. It's a promising premise, he writes, for the new instalment. And the early execution is fantastic. Eh, yes, I mean, by the standards of the rest of the film, the opening sequence is alright. At least there's a bit of intrigue there. It's not, it's not as cheap and tawdry as the rest of the film is. Um, that's it. But it echoes the thirteenth floor, etc. If you want to know a few, the major you can skip that. Blah, blah. Um, yeah, Reeves is good in the first act, and he is. Gary Reeves does a good deadbeat guy. He obviously, you know, he does the the miserable, put upon, tech worker very well. You know, you can see that he's mixed up. That again, it goes to the humanizing point I made earlier. Um, that does work. And it's a shame, actually, they didn't do more with it. Um, I don't think, actually, Trinity does a huge amount to humanise herself. You see, she's in two scenes, I think, before she starts kicking ass at the end. And you get a sense that, yeah, that there is more to her than there used to be, but just just no. Um, but, yeah, from the beginning, the writing feels disposable, which is a really kind way of saying it's shit because they weren't interested in the writing. Where the Matrix yearned to talk about big ideas like free will and the nature of reality, Resurrections is a series of burns on tech bros, obsessive fans, the media industry, people who think quoting movies makes them cool, and other lesser contemporary villains, which is true. That's that's pretty much it. That's a really good summary. Um, but it doesn't even pay very much attention to any of these targets. It doesn't care enough about the targets to at least burn them properly. Like, tech bros appear as the, the bots in the film, and that's overt, but it's they're they're just an artifice. They're they're a device. They're an excuse for something in the plot to happen. 
there's no, there's never any actual explanation as to what happens, what they are, who they are, why they are. They're just a thing that happens to create some kind of manufactured peril when the plot needs manufactured peril to happen. So it's not even as though they care enough about the things they are attacking to attack them properly. It's just... It's just bad. It's just bad. Um, you know, it's worse trapped than The Hobbit from Peter Jackson, because at least The Hobbit vaguely stuck to source material, and you could go back and read the book and think, yeah, I can see that they fucked this up. Um, that was, you know, but with The Matrix, with this film, it's not even as though they've ruined a good premise. It's just that they didn't care enough about the premise in the begin with. This is like what would happen The Hobbit if J.R. Tolkien had just, you know, smoked acres of marijuana and said, eh, I'll put words on page and then Peter Jackson can make a film of it. That's the equivalent here, I think. There's nothing in it. Um, there's nothing, there's nothing to like. There's nothing to like at all. Um, but yeah, like the original film riffs on the tropes of, of the 1990s. It does it quite cleverly. Um, you know, it's, it's, it is always worth remembering how remarkable The Matrix was when it came out. The, the time when mobile phones were a novelty, never mind smartphones. Um, and the internet, there were still articles headlined in the Daily Mail with stuff like, the internet could well be a passing fad, experts say. Um, is I, I'm not really old enough to remember much of the 90s. I just about remember the first Matrix film when it first came out. I don't think I was old enough to watch it, which meant I probably watched it anyway. But it is, yeah, it's worth remembering how impactful the first film was, how much it had to say about this growing awareness of a disconnect between our digitalized and our real selves. It was, in its own way, kind of profound. At least it aspired to stuff. You know, I, I watched The Matrix in philosophy lessons at school. I've done BAs and MAs in philosophy and ethics. Um, I read philosophy a lot. It's it's fairly interesting. It has all of its Gnostic, uh, Gnostic Christian references, Nebuchadnezzar, Nostromo, um, Morpheus himself, Trinity, Neo. These are all, you know, laden with subtext, all of these things. There's clearly a lot of time and effort been put into the meaning of the thing, but this, The Matrix Resurrections, doesn't give a fuck. It doesn't even care about internet trolls enough to, to name them. It's just shallow and, and horrid. It's just it's just pathetic. It, there's there's no there's nothing in it that makes it worthwhile to watch. Um it, here you start to get again, this is another kind of positive review. But the only thing that these people have to say about how it, the way it's positive is, is its political subtext. It takes back the red pill from all those nasty internet people who've used the red pill to mean waking up from wokeness, essentially. The problem with this being that... Okay, so when George Orwell was... The last book review he was ever writing was of Evil in War's Brideshead Revisited. So that's basically one of my favourite authors reviewing one of my favourite authors. Of course, Orwell died while he was writing it, so we never got to the end of that book review. But in that book review, he says, essentially, that it might once upon a time have taken courage to defend certain radical propositions and the case he gives is um because of bright had revisited the the validity the morality the acceptability of homosexuality for instance it might once have taken some courage to to espouse this moral view he says but things change and it no longer is the case that it requires this level of moral firmament it doesn't require this this oomph this moral seriousness in your character it's not as risky as it was even in the 1960s as it was in the 1940s it's not as risky today as it was back then and i think the wachowskis and other people have this problem as well they really object to um the use of the red pill by what they term the alt right for instance because they they are still locked in this mindset where the ideas that they hold are the radical ones but their ideas on trans rights for instance their ideas on free speech, their ideas on politics generally, are the ones held by every single establishment institution, every establishment media figure, every establishment politician. These are the conservative morals of our day. I use that term conservative and only in the strict sense of maintaining the current, not the, the ideological conservative sense. Radicals always have this problem where everything they believe becomes the established norm. And then they have no radicalism to claim anymore, but they, they try to do this. This is the problem with the red pill thing. The red pill is actually much better used by people on the right, or at least people who oppose social justice warrior type movements, precisely because the social justice radicals are supported by every major institution in the country at this point. There's nothing radical about holding these views. And they are also so demonstrably antithetical to basic science, to basic facts, to standards of debate and to argument, to basic moral values like free speech. It's incredibly important that we remember 
the radicalism that won these ideas. But that radicalism is, is like a fire which is running out of fuel. It keeps burning hotter and brighter in a bid to suck all things into itself. And that's causing immense damage, and it leads people to believe the kind of in-the-matrix things that the Wachowskis believe about certain political ideas, for instance, or certain sociological phenomenon. And taking the red pill, it doesn't have to be used by the right. I know based people on the left as well. But it is a better use, it's much better used by anti-SJW types than it is by SJW types. And it's unfortunate for the Wachowskis that they've lived long enough to see their creation used better by other people. Um, but that is the state we now live in and they will have to accept that um but as this review comments by dana stevens this is in slate likes the fact that they've attempted to reclaim the red pill from those horrible bots on social media um and we can go back and find yeah so they, they start you know she starts off with the, the background to the to the original matrix you know it's, the, the internet was a novelty in the 90s etc uh the sequels weren't particularly good um, there's some welcome comedy, apparently, contrasting our hero's world-saving past to his schlumpy present. Apparently, the first Matrix movie was very funny, while each one since uh, since then up until now has been less so. I don't really remember comedy in the first Matrix film very much, but okay, we'll, we'll go with that. Um, the world gets shaken up by the arrival of new Morpheus, etc. Um, we go through the plot. It's a, a movie... That's the point. This is what I was looking for. It is a movie, Slate writes, uh, interested in collapsing binaries. This is a point that also is brought out in other reviews as well. And it's a bit silly. It's a bit silly. Um, the ones between man and machine, between digital and real life, between past and present, and of course between genders. Of the rebel leaders running the show in Zion and its new sister city, Io. All are people of colour, all but one are women, and one appealing new character, Bugs, is the most explicitly queer character in the franchise to date. So, yeah, this is this is kind of interesting only in the sense that you have to look incredibly carefully to bring these points out of this film. These points don't jump out at you. And that's what I was saying earlier about the pleasing aspect of this film being precisely that it does not throw its politics down your throat in the way that many people expected it to. That's actually a really intriguing thing about this film. You have to look pretty closely to find anyone apart from Niobe leading Io, for instance. You meet some kind of botanist woman. Okay, cool. Um... We know Zion from the original films is the leadership. The leadership council of Zion is yes, that is very diverse. It features um, uh, who's that? Um, uh, he's a black social scientist in America, quite radical. Um, ah, uh, why have I forgotten his name? Writes for lots of lefty outlets. It might come back to me, but um, yeah, we know that. But in this film, you don't see any of this. Really, you see Niobe. She's pretty much the only person ruling Io. Bugs, I quite like kind of as a character, precisely because they don't give enough time and attention to Bugs to make her really irritating, which is the problem with a lot of modern writing. Because they don't load her with much story, they don't load her with more, um, they don't load her with their own political messaging so much, she actually begars, she, she belies her appearance, because you think, oh, there's a young woman with colored hair, she's obviously going to be a rampant SJW. No, they do what they should do with new female characters, and they just let them go through the film and show who they are by their actions. And the, the supposedly queer stuff, apparently she's the most explicitly queer character in the franchise to date. From what I remember, very little of that, and I like that. I'm all for more queer characters in film. Fine, I don't care. As long as they're done well, that seems to me to be fine. I don't think anyone should have, be able to have a problem with introducing gay characters, lesbian characters, queer characters, whatever, so long as the point of the thing you're making, the point of the film itself, is not just look how brilliant queer sexuality is. Because that's not what makes for good stories. I did this review of, um, I did this, yeah, there was a video I put up last week, week before, on the tendency of Marvel, for instance, and DC to go around making established superheroes gay. I was like, no, I'm all for more gay superheroes, but just don't try and nick established superheroes and don't make the point of the story that sexuality is all great and wonderful and brilliant because nobody cares it's it's dull what we want to see is well-written characters well-written stories people you can come to care about through their actions and through their relationships you can show their relationships just don't preach their relationships and actually bugs in this film are, yeah i mean you could actually there's room for interpretation even it's so vaguely done it's so subtly done that you don't look at her and think, ah, lesbian. Great. 
that you can see a couple of scenes where she's interacting with other characters toward the end of the film, and you think, oh, okay, no, yeah, that I, I can see that. Um, I would see that. <laughs> I can see that. That's all fine. That's quite subtly done. I will praise the film for this because I think this is this is a good thing. But I would be much more inclined to praise it if I didn't think it was just a result of really lazy acting. Sorry, not lazy acting, lazy writing. That seems to me to be the guiding sort of methodology of this film. So it's much more likely that the character was accidentally written well than it is the character was deliberately written well. Um, but again, you have to look really closely to pick these things out. So the fact that reviews are having to go this deep into the film to say, look, okay, the film itself might be shit, but if you look really closely in the corner of this scene, you can see a person who might be a lesbian. They're grasping at straws here. Um, anyways, this review continues. One line the script does go out of its way to hold, however, is the distinction between what taking the red pill means within the Matrix universe, liberation, full engagement in the social and political world, waking up, and what the phrase has come to mean after its co-optation by right-wing trolls, handing over one's critical thinking skills to social media-born lies, fulminating against wokeness. Matrix Resurrection's pointed barbs about the way the series' mythology has been appropriated by some of the most dangerous actors in contemporary political culture demonstrate that however familiar some of its visual iconography may have become, this is a franchise that has always kept its eyes wide awake and trained on the present day. So, not actually a comment really on the quality of the film, it's just, if we look closely, we can find somewhere bending this to our preconceived political notion and agendas, and good. That that makes the film good. Um, just, no. No, it wasn't Ibram Kendi I'm thinking of. Um, I want, it's, and I was about to say, it's not Colin Kaepernick. Uh, is it Colin? Oh, he writes for The Nation a lot. He's old. He's been around for ages. Um, he's... he's a, um, Yeah, I'm sure he's a, basically a Marxist social philosopher. Um, uh, I might Google him if this doesn't come back to me. But um, back to the point about um, this just very quickly. So, yeah, if you, if you can... The problem, as I've said already, is that you can try and reclaim the red pill if you like Wachowski's. But until you start believing things that are not self-evident nonsense and compelling those things by the very kind of group thing, social media-born lies and group thing that you criticize others for holding, then it's right that your political opponents use the red pill and encourage you to take it too. Because you should. It's perfectly possible to take the red pill, to be red-pilled and not hate trans people. I'm one of these people, not a trans person. I'm one of the people who's fairly red-pilled but doesn't hate trans people, for instance. Um, I couldn't really it just doesn't work that way um it it's just i was happy when the film didn't inject this kind of politics too overtly into itself there were lines in it as i've said not least the dialogue with neil patrick harris is uh, not the architect the analyst um there are lines of course but actually they're relatively small parts of the film as i say you have to look quite closely to pull these out to make them the bigger point of the film um but it's 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 not a red pilled film either, and it should the directors, the writers in particular, should perhaps come more around to other people's definition of the red pill because they're never going to be able to reclaim it for themselves. The internet has it now, and if the internet has a thing, the internet very seldom lets it go until it becomes boring, and the red pill concept won't become boring for as long as you continue to show that you've taken about a tub full of blue pills every day you wake up. But um, the last I think the last positive is it the last one. Um, yeah, the last sort of really good review I could find was The Independent, I suppose, predictably. Um, which, it, it actually, this this is the one that's objective. It just says, well, it's given it four stars, but it's four out of five. And it says it's back doing what it best does best confusing us. Which I don't, again, it's one of those barbed praises. It's damning with a, damning with faint praise. If you say that it's really good because it's really confusing. This is what some people said about Inception. I think Inception is a really overrated film. I don't think complexity is an excuse for plot. Um, it's not in the same league as this film in terms of how shit it is, but it's the same argument. Oh, it's so complex, I don't understand it, therefore it must be good. Um, it's not. But uh, what other future could you imagine for The Matrix, the foremost reality rupturing cultural phenomenon of the 20th century, than for its last, uh, latest sequel to reveal it's all just been a fiction contained within its own protagonist's head? Um, yeah, already confused, the plot summary, already confused, good, that means The Matrix is back doing what it does best, it's a volcanic cluster of ideas at a time when Hollywood is all too content to slap the broad declaration of it's really about trauma on a film and call it a day. 
and that comes largely from the determined individualism of its director, Lana Wachowski. And there is a tongue firmly up Miss Wachowski's ass at this point. Um, here taking solo reigns of the franchise, Miss Sister, uh, whose outlook on the Matrix Resurrections both reasserts her personal vision and takes stock of the franchise's thorny legacy. It's also a reminder that long black coats and tiny sunglasses are indeed very cool. Um, no, it's it's missing the point of the original. The, the original film was not confusing. The original film was allegorical, and the point of allegory is to make complex ideas familiar via the telling of stories which are themselves familiar. This is the allegory of Plato's cave, just transferred to the digital age. Does anyone actually confused by the original Matrix? The basic premise being that reality is a simulation, and if you are dragged unwillingly from that simulation, you are into the real world. There is a war between man and machines. The machines rely on the on the Matrix to survive, and the one can is the only one who can fight back against them. That's not a that's not a confusing plot. The point of the first Matrix is not to confuse you. It starts to get more confusing in two and three when they start adding to the lore because they're not necessarily very good writers, the Wachowskis. They do some they sort of confuse lore building with storytelling. Um and actually the best lore is you can get you can glean by extension of story. Story should come first, lore should be built around story. And then once you've got multiple entries you can make the law fit, make continuity after the fact. Yeah, the original film was simple, as Mr. Sons in the chat says. It was it was the reason it's so popular is because it was understandable. It generally speaking, highly convoluted and complex things do not attain mass audiences. The Matrix spoke to something very basic and universal, which is a deep sort of cultural suspicion of modernity and a deep dissatisfaction with the kind of drudging lives that we live and this longing for the idea that there could be something else, something more, something outside. It also, the cleverness about it was that it showed that what was more, what was outside, was not cost-free, it was not nice, it was not um, it was not happy meadows full of angels playing harps, eating feta cheese. It was grim and gritty and difficult. That was That was its genius, but everybody understood it. The point of a good film is not to confuse you, as this review seems to think it is. Um, yeah, it's just... We see this this argument from from people like the Independent again. It's not really a comment on the the moral worthiness of the film or the technical worthiness of the film. It's just it's confusing. The Matrix is confusing, therefore good, and that's just that's just not right. But um, and then finally this is sort of the ultimate one, which is it's no one can say if it's good or bad, but it at least makes you think. Yeah, I mean it makes me think in the sense that. How the hell did this get made? How can anyone put their name to this as a writer? How did this get signed off on? How did they think this was a good idea? What do they think they're doing to us? Who do they think they are? It does make me think. It just doesn't make me think about a lot of the things I think they want me to think about. Because it's unlike the other films. Even 2 and 3 attempt some kind of philosophy, even if they make it very much subservient to, um, to fight scenes. But... No, it it doesn't make you think in a good way. It's just it's just a complete mess. That's what it is. It's a complete mess. But um yeah, that that's that's longer than I thought it was going to be. Hence my voice croaking. But um yeah, that's that's been good. I have sort of got, <laughs> got some thoughts in mind. Thank you to chat as well because that's been a big help. But um it's just this is uh, yeah, I mean also in in chat makes a good point that you can argue the original film is more relevant today now. Because then it could play on fears about emerging technology, which didn't really go much beyond the internet as a concept. And granted, that's a big one. And things like mobile telephones. But the basic technology was all very rudimentary. Like all the phones were landlines. You had to have a landline to get in and out of the matrix. If you didn't use a protected line, someone was watching you, someone was tracking you, and you'd be nabbed by the agents. Anyone can be an agent. Nobody quite knows. Um, the technology on the ships is really basic as well, because you know the implication being that the world ended at a time when everyone was using like Windows ninety five, and that works. And you can kind of see how that could also work even more in in this, because now we've got the fully developed concept of the internet. We know something more about the extent of the internet than we do now, but we also know the ways in which it can really, really do wrong, do harm. This film trades an interesting philosophical exploration of that for cheap jibes against online keyboard warriors, which is just so not within the spirit of the on the imagination of the original film. So you could you could do
do a lot of good with a film set now and another matrix set today um but this film just abandons all of that and the problem is as well by abandoning all of that by abandoning the rudimentary tech it also allows for a number of plot contrivances which just remove the peril of the original film so in the original film it mattered that you could only for instance get in and out of the matrix via a landline that was really important because it meant that you'd have to go distances between landlines you'd have to really you know and every time you'd be at risk of being discovered by an agent and killed a lot of the chase scenes in the original matrix are them trying to get to landlines to get out of the matrix this film you don't need one of those you can go in and out via mirrors i think and some other ways as well sometimes if you just unplug people they can be on they can be in the matrix and outside the matrix at the same time as happens to trinity and this removes a really subtle but important thing when it comes to establishing uh, threatening scenarios when it comes to establishing meaningful action episodes because it's just too easy it's an easiness now that they have moving around the world it doesn't work that way there are little things like this when you're writing any kind of action sequence the little things are the things that really make the difference between a scene which is tense a scene which hooks you a scene which has real stakes and involvement and a scene which is just there because action needs to happen and something like the telephone link in the original matrix makes those sequences much more tense because you have the goal you know what the goal is the goal is something fundamentally limiting and limited whereas if you make it easy as you do now you just come in and out as you please you can jump through a mirror the size of a, a small window if you want to as they do in one part on a train there's just there's no equivalent tension to any of the chase sequences for instance because there's no real defined goal there's nothing rudimentary to attach yourself to um but we've got yeah in, in the modern internet there's so much you can play with so much you can play with and they don't do any of that either it's just it's incredibly incredibly lazy that's pretty much the defining uptake the, the defining feeling one gets from this film is that they didn't give a fuck and so why should you and if you go in there expecting to give a fuck, you will be very angry. If you go in there and you think, I know this is going to be trash and I don't care and I've given up all hope for the Matrix, then you'll be all right. But uh, if you go in there sort of half hoping that they might redeem themselves or having any fondness left for the franchise, just be prepared to be really, really angry and annoyed. But um, yeah. Anyway, I think, given that my voice is going and given that it is now coming up to 3 a.m. in the uh, in old blighty in the United Kingdom. I might call that a night for this one. But um, I think this has gone quite nicely. So thank you to a few of you in the chat who've been watching this long. Um, thank you for your patience and thank you for contributing as well. Um, this has been this has been good. And yeah, my, my butt cheeks are actually hurting again because I've been on a hard chair now for three hours. But funnily enough, this hard chair for three hours is less painful to me than the really nice soft cinema chair was in two hours because I'm not watching the matrix resurrections which i think says something about the matrix resurrections but um yep i will i will call that a night um but thank you again to chat we're going to try and do these a lot more i think because i think these are just good fun and they're casual and they're easy to do and it's nice to be able to talk with you guys in chat so we will we will do some more very soon but in the interim have a good day all have a good night all on sunday we'll have a few reviews going out um so stick around for those and of course, in the interim, have a very, very Merry Christmas, everyone, and uh, we'll see you very soon.